Cable Ship McKay Bennett was a transatlantic cable laying and cable repair ship registered at Lloyd's of London, as a Glasgow vessel, but owned by the American Commercial Cable Company. It is remembered for being the ship that recovered the majority of the bodies of the victims of the Titanic sinking. The ship was commissioned by the USA-based commercial cable company from then noted River Clyde-based warship builders John Elder and Company at their Fairfield Yards. The company incorporated a number of then new and original features into the cable ship. It was one of the first ships built from steel rather than iron, and she had a relatively deep keel designed to both accommodate as much cable as possible and to keep the ship stable in the Atlantic Ocean swells. The design was also very hydrodynamic to keep her fuel efficient and fast in operation. The hull design included bilge keels to keep her stable, and she had two rudders, one fore and one aft, to maximize maneuverability. Named after the two founders of her owners, she was launched late in 1884. Her crew pronounced her name Mackie Bennett. Mainly based in Halifax, Nova Scotia, where she first arrived in March 1885, she was also often used for operations on the European side of the Atlantic, based out of Plymouth, England. The Canadian author Thomas Raddle worked as wireless operator aboard McKay Bennett and based some short stories on his experiences aboard. In addition to carrying out numerous difficult cable repairs, many during times of wartime danger, due to the nature of her work and resultant position in the Atlantic, McKay Bennett performed many rescues. Typical was the rescue of the crew of the sinking schooner Caledonia on 12 February 1912. In April 1912, she was berthed at Halifax during a period of long-term work maintaining the France to Canada communications cable. Of the three ships in Halifax at that time only McKay Bennett had a hold capable of holding the 125 coffins and ice forming part of the exercise to recover bodies. The ship became famous as the main vessel contracted by the White Star Line to carry out the difficult task of recovering the bodies left floating in the North Atlantic, after the Titanic disaster. The task was further motivated by Joseph Astor's announcement of a $100,000 reward for the ship recovering the body of his father J. J. Astor. Her captain, Frederick H. Lander, took on board a combination of specialists and an effective mobile mortuary. Both additional and specialized personnel and supplies were taken on board for the assignment. This included Canon Kenneth Cameron Hind of All Saints Cathedral, Halifax. John R. Snow, Jr., the chief embalmer with the firm of John Snow and Company, the province of Nova Scotia's largest undertaking firm, hired by White Star to oversee the embalming arrangements. Madeline Astor, wife of J.J. Astor. Sufficient embalming supplies to handle 70 bodies. 100 coffins. 100 long tons of ice in which to store the recovered bodies. Crew were paid double pay for the grisly task. There was a hierarchy to the mortuary details as the ship could never hope to bring all back. First class passengers were embalmed and placed in coffins, second class were wrapped in linen winding sheets, third class bodies were weighted and buried at sea, 116 in total. The ship left Halifax at 12.28 pm on Wednesday, the 17th of April 1912. Due to severe fog and rough seas it took the ship nearly four days to sail the 800 nautical miles to the scene of the disaster. The captain instructed the ship's crew to keep their logbooks complete and up to date during the voyage and subsequent recovery operation, but only two logbooks are presently known to have survived, seven pages from the logbook of engineer Frederick A. Hamilton, now kept in the National Maritime Museum, England, and the personal diary of Clifford Crease, a 24-year-old naval artificer, craftsman in training. Much of the detailed account of the recovery operation is today traced to Creases. Diary, now held in the public archives of Nova Scotia. The ship arrived during the night, so recovery of bodies started at 6 o'clock on the 20th of April. The CS McKay Bennett was anchored close to but not within the recovery area, and she offloaded her skiff lifeboats. Crews then rowed into the recovery area and manually recovered the bodies into the skiffs. After recovering as many bodies as they deemed safe for the return journey, 51 corpses, 
the crews then rowed back to the C.S. McKay Bennett. The captain noted that there was neither sufficient space aboard to store all of the recovered bodies nor enough embalming supplies aboard. As the Canadian government and associated burial and maritime laws directed that any bodies carried had to be embalmed before a ship enter a Canadian port, the captain agreed to a system whereby first-class passengers were embalmed, placed in coffins, and stored in the rear cable locker. These included the bodies of John Jacob Astor IV, the richest man aboard, body number 124 recovered on the 22nd of April, identified by his unique diamond finger ring and the initials sewn on the label of his jacket, architect Edward Austin Kent, body number 258, and Isidore Strauss, owner of Macy's department store. Second-class passengers were embalmed, wrapped in canvas, and stored in the forward cable locker. Third-class passengers were buried at sea, a total of 116 passengers. In October 2013, a photograph taken by 4th Officer R. D. Westy Leggett came up for auction, which captured the cannon ministering over a ceremony of multiple burials at sea on board the ship. The body of band leader Wallace Hartley, found fully dressed with his music case strapped to his body, was transferred to the Arabic and returned to England, where on the 18th of May he was buried in Keithley Road Cemetery, Cone, Lancashire. One body of an approximately two-year-old male infant, a third-class passenger and the fourth body recovered, was saved by the crew and stored in the hold. At 19 o'clock on the 23rd of April, C.S. McKay Bennett lay briefly alongside the Allen shipping line Sardinian, en route to St. John, New Brunswick, to collect additional canvas. Just after midnight on the 26th of April, C.S. McKay Bennett rendezvoused with the Anglo-American Telegraph Company's C.S. Minya to get extra embalming supplies, before departing for Halifax at dawn that day. After a seven-day recovery operation, the C.S. McKay Bennett had recovered 306 of the 328 bodies found from among the 1,517 who perished aboard Titanic. Buried 116 at sea, of which only 56 were identified. Set sail for home with 190 bodies on board, almost twice as many as there were coffins available. Arrived in Halifax on 30 April 1912, began unloading her cargo at 9.30, and transferred the bodies to the ice rink of the Mayflower Curling Club. The crew split the $100,000 reward for Astor's body, around $2,500 each. Using some of that money they paid for the burial of the body of the unknown child and his headstone monument, the casket was marked by a copper plaque reading Our Babe. The entire ship's crew, together with the majority of the population of Halifax, attended the child's burial at Fairview Lawn Cemetery on 4 May 1912. With improved DNA testing, on 30 July 2007 Canadian researchers at Lakehead University announced that testing of the body's mitochondrial DNA had revealed that the child was 19-month-old Sidney Leslie Goodwin. After his death in 1955, Clifford Creese's body was interred only a few steps away from the grave of our babe, a site he had visited on every anniversary of the tragedy during his lifetime. McKay Bennett Seamount one of the Fogo Sea Mounts southeast of the Grand Banks of Newfoundland in the North Atlantic Ocean, is named after McKay Bennett for her involvement in the Titanic disaster. The ship was retired in May 1922, anchored in Plymouth Sound to be used as a storage hulk. During the Blitz on England in World War II, she was sunk during a Nazi Germany Luftwaffe attack but later refloated. Her hulk was finally scrapped in 1965. Thank you for listening, and if you would like to hear more biographies, please leave a comment below and perhaps give a thumbs up and subscribe to help my channel. Thank you again for listening.